Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Wednesday where I get to ask uh, and answer uh, all of your life's difficult problems, such as who should I marry? You know, what should I name my child? Right? All those important questions, you can bring it up to me and I'll answer them for you. Not a problem. <laughs> well, today we're going to have a special topic today, which is how to improve your hey, credit. Up, oh, I got to get my audio back uh, turned off here on my phone. Um, so we're going to answer some questions that you may have about how to improve your credit. I know a lot of the challenges or the difficulties that people have using our strategy is not being able to use our strategy because of lack of credit. Uh, whether you have a poor credit score or you have poor credit uh, history, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about how to improve them. And fortunately, there's no you know repair credit quick type of pill, but uh, what we can talk about are long-term uh, tactics and strategies that's going to help you improve your credit. So uh, I think we're two minutes out from the show, uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, welcome people in. I got Brian Bright Ageman. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. He says, really like your education. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, so before we get started, go ahead and comment down below. Where are you guys from? Uh, go and type in your city, your state. We'll love to greet you guys in. And uh, I don't know, maybe share something interesting about you, what you had for breakfast, uh, what song were you listening to this morning. Uh, so go ahead and uh, comment down below, and uh, we're at, we'll answer some questions that are coming in. We're going to greet you guys in as you guys come in. So uh, let's go ahead and turn this around where I can see the questions. There we go. Perfect. So we got two minutes until our show begins. Uh, and typically before, we, we would like to see where you guys are from and get to, guys, get to know you guys a bit better. So um, hopefully I would have a more of an enjoyment time. I mean, I enjoy doing these shows, right? I enjoy answering your questions. But I think I'm going to enjoy it even more because now we got this amazing air conditioner, this mini air conditioner that I bought yesterday at Walmart. I, I don't get paid to tell you guys this, but this is amazing. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but here in the studio, we got lights everywhere that's literally beaming on my face, and it's cooking my face slowly and surely, and by the, by the time we're done doing these lives, I look like a, I look like I'm literally like baked, so I'm glad that we have this personal air conditioner that uh, is blowing cold, uh, cold air at me, that way I'm not like literally melting, or uh, inside I'm not like in a Korean sauna, right, so... Uh, if you have never been to a Korean sauna, I definitely recommend that you do. It's going to be the most relaxing experience ever. The only disturbing part is everyone has their clothes off, so that's the only disturbing part. But if you're okay with that, if you're okay with that, uh, you're going to enjoy Korean sauna. Like, it, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's very relaxing. So, uh, let's see who's all here. Oh, it's 11 o'clock already. So, uh, I want to welcome everyone in. Welcome to the show. Uh, it is officially 11 o'clock Central Time, and uh, this is where I get to answer all of your life's important questions, which today we're going to talk about how to improve your credit. So, you guys can go and throw in your questions about how do I improve my credit? This is my situation. Uh, you know, I have this going on with my HELOC. I need some help. Uh, or you may have questions related to real estate. We can, we can answer some of that. But we do have a whole dedicated day just for real estate investing on Mondays at 11 o'clock Central. Uh, we're going to try to focus on the topic today. So we got Jade, who's from New York. Welcome, welcome. Clarice from Salt Lake City, Utah. Amazing. Which, by the way, I love the mountains in Salt Lake City. Uh, I, I absolutely love it. So uh, welcome, everybody. Joel from uh, California. Welcome, welcome. So uh, today we're gonna again we're gonna go with the topic of how to improve your credit. Now before we do, I want to talk about our sponsor real quick, and that is PropStream. So PropStream is a software that my brother and I love to use, along with all most of our listeners. Uh, if you are interested in real estate investing, you're looking for real estate deals. Uh, maybe you're looking at a house and you don't know who the owner is. Well, fear not. PropStream is here to help you guys. What PropStream does it it helps you guys find deals. It helps you find off market deals. It helps you find who the contact or who the owner is and their contact information. It also uh, does uh, rehab estimate. So if you're uh, if you're not a, a construction expert, uh, you may want to uh, use PropStream to get an idea of how much things are going to cost to rehab. Uh, PropStream is also connected with the MLS, which is what real estate agents use to get their data. So get PropStream today. Uh, my listeners can get seven days of free trial using PropStream. You guys can go and sign up right now, and that is through reisoftware.com. 
thequadbrothers.com. Again, that's REI Software.thequadbrothers.com. Sign up for a free seven day, seven day trial, and trust me, once you go prop stream, you'll never go back. So uh, let's go and answer some questions about uh, the uh, how to improve some credit, right? And I know we have some couple questions and comments already. Uh, we got Marta from Madison, Wisconsin. Awesome, and she says she loves me. Well, I love you too, Marta. I appreciate your kind words. Uh, we got DD Crew that's saying link for me not working for a calculator. Uh, it's from Minnesota. So uh, DD Crew, uh, if you can go and contact our office or send us an email, we can definitely help you square that problem away. Okay. Uh, we got Montana. Hello from Montana, uh, David Anson. Uh, BJ is is asking what MLS are they connected with? Uh, I believe, if you're referring to PropStream, I believe they're nationwide. So they're connected with nationwide MLS. I know there are different regions and zones with the MLS. Uh, for the PropStream, I believe it's connected to uh, to the nationwide MLS, uh, all the database that you're looking for around the nation. Okay. So let's go over, talk about credit. And um, the, the number one issue and the problem that I see with our listeners and with our students is that their credit score is shot. Now, I'm going to break down uh, the whole idea of credit score and how that, how that relates to our strategy, a HELOC strategy. And of course, you need decent credit to get a HELOC, right? To get a mortgage in the first place. So a lot of people believe uh, that you need to have certain level of HELOC or certain level of credit score to get approved. So it's really important to understand, guys, that credit score alone does not approve you for any sort of loan or lending instrument or lending, uh, um, lending tool, right? So let's say that you have a 600 credit score, okay, FICO. And that's another thing I want to talk about. And I, I know this may be like changing gears or we're going off to drift a little bit. Um, when it comes to credit scores, guys, there are hundreds of different types of credit scores out there. There's FICO 5, FICO 6, FICO 7, FICO 8, and the new FICO 9. Um, I don't think there's a FICO 6. I may have to take that back. Um, there's Vantage 3.0, and there's National Equivalency. Uh, there's a lot of different types of credit scores that are out there. Just because you pull up a phone app and it tells you you have a 600, 600 FICO score does not necessarily mean that you have 600 FICO score, period. You may have a 600 FICO score uh, through FICO 5. You may have uh, a 600, 600 credit score through Vantage 3.0, but you may have a completely different type of a credit score with a different scoring model. So there are different scoring models. So if you're going to go and get a, an auto loan, you, it's going to be based on, let me just delete this real quick. It's going to be based on FICO auto which is a whole different type of credit scoring model than if you were to use, let's say, FICO uh, mortgage, okay? Totally different scoring model, right? So if you're gonna go shop for, uh, for an auto and you need, you need an auto loan, they're gonna go and use a different scoring model, a rubric, to score your credit report versus the same thing with FICO, uh, FICO mortgage, FICO home, where if you're gonna go shop for a mortgage or any sort of home-related financial product, they're gonna go and pull a, a use the FICO mortgage, FICO home uh, scoring model to determine your credit score. So, guys, no, not not a single credit score is ever equal or same. Uh, and FICO, in fact, FICO credit scores can change monthly. So, <coughs> just because. Um, you have a set number of FICO score, or a set number of credit score, does that mean it's the end all be all? Now, going back to my earlier conversation about uh, does does credit score alone determine my eligibility? Well, yes and no. Um, there's a myth out there that people believe that if you have a certain credit score, it automatically approves you for a loan, which is not true. Um, credit scores work very similar similar to like a college college entrance exam score. Uh, we all know the ACT, SAT, right, uh, scoring model. So just because you have a perfect 36 on your ACT, or I don't know what the scoring model is for SAT, that's how bad of a student I was. Um, even if you had a perfect SAT or ACT score, does not necessarily mean that you're automatically approved to go to Harvard or MIT, right? There's going to there's gonna be other criteria to look at. Now, do you get an automatic decline uh, at a certain level? Sure, there's a there's a prerequisite, right? Uh, in order to go to Harvard or MIT, you need to have a certain uh, base minimum of score that you need to have to be even considered. So 
as far as for mortgages or for HELOCs or credit cards, um, you have a, the banks have a set minimum credit score that they're going to look at. Um, doesn't mean, though, that you're automatically approved at that, uh, at that score. So let's say a certain bank has a uh, minimum credit score that's required at 640. Okay, so below 640, I'm actually going to put it right here in the middle. Okay, below 640, you're automatically declined, right? They're not even going to look at your file. They're like, nope, sorry, 640, not going to look at it. Okay, there might be exceptions. I'm not, uh, this isn't uh, absolute, right? There's going to be exceptions where you may say, well, I, you know, I, I do have 640 credit score, but look at my bank account or look at my debt to income ratio, right? Can you reconsider? Um, there's, a ways, there's ways to do that if you have a relationship with the bank. But generally speaking, uh, with exceptions, uh, most banks are going to look at your 640 credit score or whatever their minimum credit score is going to be for a specific financial, financial product. They may decline you or they may be less motivated to even look at your file because of the credit score. Now, after, let's say you have 640 or more, okay, greater than 640, right? Uh, greater or equal, let's put it that way. Uh, they're going to say, you know what, you do have a 640 credit score, 641, 642. Let's go and take a look at your tax returns. Let's go and take a look at your debt to income ratio. Let's go and take a look, look at your assets and your liabilities. That's when they're going to go and take a look at your file a little bit more closely to see if you're going to be approved for, let's say, HELOC or mortgage or uh, line of credit, whatever the case might be. So just because you have a set number of FICO score or credit score does not guarantee you guys for the uh, the HELOC or mortgage or whatever financial product that you're looking at a shop. I know we have something going on here. Um, detected a new device. Someone's trying to hack us. My theory is a North Korean spy that's been trying to get us uh, for many, many months. That's just my theory. Dave's laughing back there. Uh, there we go. We got rid of the North Korean spy. Uh, anyhow, banks, banks don't just look at credit scores. They're going to look at your entire picture of where you are uh, in terms of determining your eligibility and your uh, qualifications for these types of uh, loans. Okay, so if you have a couple questions here, uh, David Anson is, is asking, do you think it's better to pay mortgage on the first or the last day it's due, leaving the money in the HELOC longer? So yeah, David, I think you're getting the idea. The, the whole idea is trying to get the money to, to be in your HELOC, HELOC account as long as possible. Now, this all determines basically when you get paid, right? If you get paid on the first, obviously uh, you want to make sure that uh, you, want, you, you do all your expenses towards the end of the month, right? Preferably the last day of the month. If you get paid, let's say the last day of the month, now you're, now you're, you're, you're talking about having all your expenses being paid on the first of the, of the month. So uh, it really dep depends on when you get paid. Um, and uh, customizing that, that schedule of when to have your expenses leave out of a HELOC, that's all going to be determined uh, based on when you get paid so that we can leave the money in the HELOC as long as possible to reduce the average daily balance on that HELOC account. Okay, uh, we got another person, BJ, is asking, how come I always see ads on Craigslist to increase credit with tray lines? Are these all scams? So um, there, are, there are scams and illegal things that you can do. So let's go and talk about that real quick. What are some of the illegal things that you can, uh, you can do, which <laughs> it's kind of funny saying that, right, because you shouldn't be doing it. Um, here's some things that are illegal, okay? Um, legal credit improvement tactics. Okay, there we go. That should, that's an I. And those are elves. Okay, so number one, uh, here's some illegal uh, credit tactics. Obviously, this, this should be obvious, and no one should be doing this. This is crime, by the way, criminal, um, is uh, identification uh, theft, right? If you steal other people's uh, uh, ID and um, uh, identity to assume their credit file, obviously, that's illegal, right? That'd be fraud fraudulent. So number one is ID theft, okay? And what's interesting is that the number one instances where an identity theft is happening is not some stranger is trying to you know look at your your credit card bills and statements to look you know to steal your social security number to steal your credit card number um, it's not that that's 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 actually a very small minority case the majority of the case where the uh, identity theft is happening is actually within family right you you know you're you using your mom's social security number to open a bank account or you using your son's or daughter's social security number to open a credit card 
Um, that's that's more common than some stranger trying to steal your I identity through online hacks and stuff. So ID th identity theft obviously is gonna be illegal. Uh, I don't know how this is ever a credit improvement tactic, which is not. Uh, it's just a temporary criminal fix um, or benefit that they're, they're trying to get. Uh, number two is um, this. This is more. This is ha this is happening with. Um, um, a lot of the, the urban population, and I'm trying to re recall what the exact name for this is. Um, it has to do with MCN, I believe. Not an MCN. I'm trying to recall the exact name. So I'm blanking out here, guys, because uh, this is live, right? This happens. Um, I'll come back to this, but the second thing can be trade lines. There are illegal trade lines that you can get uh, that supposedly is going to improve your credit. Uh, Guys, the best and the most safest way to improve your credit is through long-term uh, decisions that you make. There's no shortcut fixes when it comes to improving credit. Now, when it comes to credit repair, that's a whole different topic. It's a whole different subject that we can talk about. But we're talking about credit improvement tactics, organic credit improvement. So yes, there are credit line uh, stuff that, that's out there on Craigslist that can be uh, unethical and illegal. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't advise that. So another one is, man, I'm, I'm blanking out on this. It's, it's what celebrities and um, politicians use. Uh, it's not a social security number, but it's a different type of number. Um, and I'm, again, I'm, I apologize, I'm blanking, blanking out on here. Um, but there's uh, a, a set of numbers that you can get, which is only uh, available for celebrities and politicians that obviously have um, a huge public presence. And they get these numbers to sort of uh, reset their social security number or to basically uh, have another social security number attached to them, right? Or another identifier for, uh, to get credit. That's also illegal, guys, for people who are just average, uh, people who are not you know, big public figures. Uh, we shouldn't be doing that. It's, it's not ethical, and, and it is illegal. Um, another thing is, um, I'll just put it on, on number three, is lying about your credit report, okay? And I see this a lot, where people will file, let's say they have a bad credit card, or let's say they're, they're behind on their credit card payment, and they just wanna get rid of this credit card uh, out of their credit report, and what people would do is simply file a police, police report saying, listen, uh, you know, my credit card was stolen or this, this credit card is not mine. Uh, someone opened up a credit card without my, my uh, permission, with my knowledge. And they falsely re do a, a police report trying to get rid of that credit account completely and just telling the creditors saying, hey, this is not mine, right? Here's my police report that proves that <laughs> this is not mine. And uh, unfortunately, this is what a lot of people do that's illegal, right? It's, it's defrauding the banks. You shouldn't be doing this. So don't lie, guys. Don't open up fake trade lines. Don't do identity theft, which happens more common amongst family members and friends. Um, so these are some of the illegal credit, credit tactics that obviously I strongly don't advise. Uh, uh, you shouldn't be doing it. You can go to jail. You can pay heavy fines. Don't do it, right? Now, let's talk about organic. Uh, what are some ways that are legal and ethical to uh, improve your credit? Okay, so these are good credit improvement tactics. Okay, there we go. What are some good ways? Well, uh, I mentioned credit repair. I think credit repair can be a good credit improvement tactics. Now, what credit, where credit repair helps you is removing or correcting um, uh, information that's incorrect or not timely, uh, those are some of the things that can be repaired and fixed on your credit report. And there's a, a statistics out there, I think it's one in five or like 80%, I'm not sure exactly, there's different types of statistics, uh, statistics out there, but uh, they say that one in five credit reports contain an error uh, that may have a negative impact on the overall credit health. So one out of five people watching this you may want to check your credit report to see if there's any inaccuracy or uh, untimely information or information that's not consistent throughout. So credit repair is a, is, is, is a tactic, is a, uh, a process where you can go and repair uh, some of those uh, in inaccurate information that could have a negative impact on your credit report. Okay, so uh, here's my pen. There we go. I gotta find my pen here. 
Oh, hold on, guys. I may have lost my pen. There we go. Um, so credit repair is one of them. Okay. And I know there's a there's a lot of shady credit repair companies out there. Um, and, it, and it could be easy to be suckered into a illegal credit repair company. Um, here's something you guys need to know about credit repair companies. Number one, they cannot charge you up front. So if they charge you any fees up front, illegal credit repair, don't work with them. Number two is if they promise or guarantee any sort of scores or any sort of removal or any sort of result, another illegal credit repair company, run away from them. Um, if they don't hand you a contract uh, to sign and, and um, if they don't give you the notices, uh, which is the Fair, no, not, not Fair Credit Reporting Act, it's the Credit, Report, Credit Repair Organization Act, so CROA, if they don't give you a little pamphlet or flyer that talks about the Credit Repair Organization Act, again, another credit repair company that's illegal, that's, that's violating the rules. So when you go shop for a credit repair company, um, when it, and of course, one thing that I do want to mention is that you can repair your own credit. You don't have to hire a credit repair company to do it. Uh, you can go and do it off of your own. And uh, when, you do, when you do decide to do it on your own, uh, be sure you do not, do not, do not, never, ever, ever, okay, you see me doing funny motions, right? That's tr just trying to get your attention. Never, ever, ever dispute anything online, okay? Engrave that into your head. Never, ever dispute anything online, okay? So if you see any accuracy, inaccuracy on your credit report, let's say your credit card is reporting wrong or your installment loan that you're still paying off is reporting the wrong balance, whatever the case might be, don't ever dispute online. Do not, okay? The reason being is that when you choose to go out the easy way of disputing online, you waive certain rights that are afforded to you that could be used as a tactic to remove or correct some uh, inaccuracy in your credit report. So you don't want to waive any rights, right? You have consumer rights. You are, you are protected under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, you don't want to waive those rights that are, that are afforded to you. So don't dis dispute online because when you dispute online, they're going to make you uh, check a box that says, hey, I waive my rights here in terms of conditions. Don't do it. Okay, dispute using actual snail mail. I know it sounds ridiculous. I know you have to pay postal service. You have to print something. Yes, I get it. But when you dispute using mail, you still retain those rights that are afforded to you under the FCRA Fair Credit Reporting Act. So don't ever, 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 ever dispute online. I know it's easy. Just click of a button. But trust me, easy doesn't necessarily mean good. So credit repair can be something that you can do on your own or you can hire a professional, much like changing your oil, right? You can change your own oil if you want to, or you can go to a professional to change your oil for you. So uh, you can hire a credit repair. I don't own a credit repair company. The only reason I have experience in this is I, I've helped uh, credit repair companies before uh, and uh, I've shadowed a credit repair company. Let's just put it that way. But um, credit repair can be a tactic, okay? Number two. Let's see, uh, where's my pen? There we go. Number two, keep your utilization low. Now, what utilization is, uh, if you look at your FICO, FICO scoring, uh, when it comes to your FICO score, there are five major factors that determine your FICO score. Uh, one of them is obviously utilization. About 30% of your FICO score uh, is going to be factored using uh, utilization rate. Now, what is utilization rate? Well, utilization rate has to do with how much credit are you using on your, on your revolving lines of credit. So uh, credit card is a revolving line. Uh, you get to pay it off, right? Use it, pay it off, and so on. Um, let's say you have a $10,000 credit card. Okay, you have a $10,000 limit, and that's the only credit card that you have ever in your personal credit uh, profile. If you use $3,000 out of the $10,000 credit card, that means you have 30% utilization rate, okay? Uh, and utilization rate factors in all of your credit cards uh, combined. So it's not just one credit card, it's if you have multiple credit cards, they're gonna combine all of your credit card limits and all the credit card balances to factor a quote-unquote master utilization rate. So. A good rule of thumb to improve your credit uh, in the long term is to keep your utilization rate below 30%, okay? Below 30%. So if you keep your, uh, let's say, credit card balance, if, you're, if you have just one credit card and that's $10,000 limit, keep it less than $3,000 uh, in a, any, any given period. Uh, you don't want to jack it up and max it up, right? That's going to you know, have a negative impact on your credit. You don't want to do that. So if you can afford it, uh, go ahead and lower your utilization rate as much as possible. 
And I think the third one that we can talk about, uh, and this is an obvious one, is pay your bills on time. Okay, pay your bills on time. Never let a credit card bill or installment bill get 30 days late, let alone 60, 90, uh, 120 days late, because obviously the more late you are, it's going to have a deeper negative impact on your credit. And it, and it has a negative impact for a longer period of the time. So pay your bills on time. I know it sounds so obvious. I know it, you know we should be learning this on in high school, uh, but it's, it shocks me every single day that there are people that wait like 60 days or 90 days to make their minimum payment. It's ridiculous. So I think most of you guys are smart, um, knowing that you guys are on our YouTube channel. I think you guys are pretty intelligent, and you guys will know that you should be paying your bills uh, when they're due on time. Okay, so those are some good credit improvement tactics. Oh, just drop that here. Um, those are some of the good credit repair, ta uh, credit improvement tactics. Um, another one is to to never, and this is this one is is, is a common mis misconception that I see a lot. Uh, where's my pen? There we go. Um, never ever. Okay, I'm gonna try to find my pen. It's, it's not cooperating with me here. I'm gonna use my mouse instead. There we go. Um, never. Okay, this pen is not cooperating. Okay. Never, let's see, it's not writing correctly. All right, guys, I'm going to ditch this. Um, here it is. Never, ever, ever, ever close out your credit card account, ever, ever, with very few exceptions, okay? Um, the reason why I suggest this is that when you close a credit account, what you're doing is, A, you're destroying your utilization rate because now you're cutting the limits, right? Number two, uh, you are just also destroying the overall age of your credit. So if you have a credit card that's like 10 years old and you decide to cancel it and, and, and uh, sh close down the account, well, guess what? Your overall age of your credit shrinks, okay? It's no longer 10 years old. The average age is no longer 10 years old. It shrinks. And now it looks like your credit, there's not, there hasn't been a whole lot of history on your credit. So even if your balance is zero on your credit, uh, credit card, leave it alone. Uh, maybe you might do an occasional gas spending on that card or you might spend money on groceries and pay it off. But don't ever close your credit credit card account uh, with very, very, very few exceptions. Okay, uh, let's go and uh, answer some questions. I know we have some questions along the way. Holy smokes, there it is. Um, let's see. Is it a good strategy to put bills on credit card, pay with the PLOC before the statement end date, then pay PLOC with HELOC, to keep average daily balance on HELOC as low as possible. Yeah, that's that's one way to do it. Um, I don't know why you will introduce two lines of credits, just use one line of credit. So um, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna go with the PLOC, go with the PLOC. If you're gonna go with the HELOC, go with the HELOC. So just go with one, don't, don't try to add complications because the more complication that you add, the less you're gonna be motivated to wanna do the strategy in the first place. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I hope my pen's working, which I don't know what's going on. I think that there's a low battery issue here. Um, there we go. I think that's, we got it to work or maybe not. Okay. We're going to ditch the, uh, the, the whiteboard. Um, the next one is going to be, let's see, Joe Villa is asking, would it be best to throw my money? I have saved in a savings account to the HELOC. Yeah. So that's actually one of the things that we suggest. Uh, that's just our opinion. Again, uh, one thing that I should have mentioned earlier in this video is that I'm not a financial advisor or a financial counselor, but I'm giving you guys opinions based on, uh, facts and, and based on uh, proven methods, right? Um, and uh, that's just my opinion. So uh, take this as a suggestion, uh, not as an advice, but that's what I would do to lower your average daily balance. And keep in mind with the, with the line of credit, you can access those funds uh, anytime you want. So it acts like a savings account. If you, you, know, if you need the, the money, you can access it from the HELOC or PLOC. Uh, but what it's doing is it's actually saving you money. It's, it's not earning you money. Uh, which I can argue it's the same thing because if you're saving, let's say, 6 to 7% <clears throat> on a given uh, savings amount, it's kind of like earning that, that amount of money, right? 6 to 7%. So um, that's something to keep in mind uh, is when you, um, when you put all of your money, your savings account uh, money into a HELOC, you're essentially saving lots of money or you're earning money because you're decreasing the average daily balance for that much amount, if that makes any sense. So uh, Joe Villa is, is saying it's a scary thought of emptying out savings account. I know it is because it goes against the conventional thought, but it's because of the conventional thought that we're in this messy debt, right? Situation that we're in. So 
we have to take uh, we have to take approaches outside the box, right? We have to take uh, approaches, and that's what we do in our business. By the way, uh, we don't have a savings account. We throw all of our money into our business line of credit and let it sit there. And if we need to uh, access it, we can access it anytime we want. That's the beauty of this. Okay. Uh, there we go. Um, Dennis rep repetition Miskowski is saying Dennis Milwaukee in the house. Keep that utilization rate down. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Ron and Cynthia Falter, keep business and personal credit separate. Yes, we have a whole entire segment on how to build cre uh, business credit. Uh, we have a video on our YouTube channel that's going to go and help you step by step build your business credit organically so that you don't have to um, try to use your own personal credit and to build your business credit. Okay. Um, Dennis Repetition Miskowski is saying, I just use Credit Karma to fix my credit. Oh no, Dennis, you did not. That is, okay, let me repeat this. <clears throat> okay, let me clear my throat, just in case. I might, I might be saying this in Korean, okay? Never, ever, ever dispute online, guys. Please don't do this, okay? Don't use Credit Karma. In fact, Credit Karma is the worst thing. You could, I, not the worst thing, but it's terrible when it comes to monitoring your credit. Credit Karma does not use FICO score. It uses Vantage. Guys, do not, please, 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 please promise me not to dispute through Credit Karma. Okay? You waive so many rights that are afforded to you. Okay? FCRA, goodbye. All right? Fair Credit Reporting Act does not, will, will not, the fullness of the Credit Reporting Act will not kick in if you choose to use online disputes. All right? I... <laughs> I hope that, I, I hope that this, this was clear of a message. Do not ever dispute online, okay? I know I'm going crazy right now. I'm going crazy because if you dispute online, you waive rights. You kiss, wave, you know, you kiss rights goodbye, and you can't use FCRA to, as a tactic to, to, to do disputes, okay? Please don't do that. All right, next up. Whew, that got me sweating. Uh, CPN, credit privacy number. Yes, thank you. That's what it was. Don't use CPN, guys. So CPN is a number. Uh, it's yeah. So it's a nine-digit number, also made up that looks like a social security number. So CPN uh, is something that you can get, but if you have to be a, a politician, you have to be a, a public figure. Most celebrities get a CPN to to protect their actual social security. Um, that's what you know. That's what that's used for. So I hope that um, uh, that's hope that's hope that that's that's what uh, the. Celebrities and sorry, I'm like blabbering here because I got distractions back there. Um, that's what celebrities and politicians use to protect their identity. Okay. Uh, Dane Rhodes is saying, would you ever use a HELOC for home repairs or do you consider that a waste when compared to paying down principal? So when it comes to, um, yeah, they're taking my, my drawing board out because it's not working. Um, all right, here we go. Man, it, it is hot in here because I'm like screaming and kicking, right? Uh, okay, so it says, would you ever use a HELOC for home repairs or do, do you consider that a waste when compared to paying down principal? So it, it all depends. Um, and I, I think I said this last week in our, in our live show. Um, when it comes to doing home improvements with your HELOC, you, you have to weigh that factor is of, is it worth putting that money into your home? Uh, meaning, are you gonna get the value out? Uh, oop, we got... That's gonna kick us out. Okay, I'm gonna actually take take this out because we don't want to. Uh, it's a distraction. There we go. Lots of crazy things happening today. I'm telling you, it's all the North Koreans attacking us today. Uh, they're after me, man. They're after me. <laughs> um, anyways, back to the question. I'm getting distracted here. Um, if you let's say you put in thirty thousand dollars to improve your kitchen or whatever, um, I my opinion is I would only do it if you can only get if you can get one and a half times worth of value back into your home. So, <laughs> sorry guys, if you're spending $30,000, you should be able to at least get $45,000 of value added back into your home. If you're not getting that, it's just a waste of money, right? It's just like, oh, I just want a nice pretty kitchen because I want to. Well, when it comes to financial decision, I mean, there's nothing wrong, I would say. You know, if you want a nice kitchen, go for it. But when you're looking at the lens of financial decision, if you're not getting your money's worth, then I would say it's a waste of time or uh, waste of money. So if you put in $30,000 into a rehab or $10,000 into a rehab, it should at least get you one and a half times or more in terms of value and return back into your home equity, uh, into your home value. Okay, does that make sense? Another thing you want to consider is that it, are you living in, an, in a market where you're seeing a prolific 
uh, appreciation, uh, you know, and I'm not talking about I'm not talking about artificial uh, appreciation where, you know, lending is easier and, and things like that. I'm talking about natural appreciation of where people are, are actually moving in uh, into your town. There's more jobs, you know, growing. There's more uh, people wanting to move into your market. That's, that's what causes a, uh, natural appreciation, right? So when, you, when you're dealing with natural appreciation, uh, when, you're have, when you're seeing a job growth, when you're seeing your market grow, uh, that may also make sense to do some improvement on your home to sort of match with what, what the other uh, homes are doing. And um, that's what I would do. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily make your home the best looking home in your block. There's no merit in doing that, really, um, especially if you live in a, um, an area where, you know, it's urban, um, where, you, you know, you don't see a whole lot of, you know, I'll give you a concrete example. Let's say your entire neighborhood is doing laminate floor and laminate countertop. And if you're the only one with granite countertop, with hardwood floor, and really nice appliances, it's really not going to increase the value of your home because your home value is based on comps, right? What other, uh, what other homes are being sold in that area. And if other homes in the area are being sold uh, in, a, in a relative price and your home is like the best looking thing, it's not going to really help you. You can only stretch your value so far based on what's happening in the market. So um, that's something you got to consider when it comes to doing improvements. Um, number one, are you getting financial returns out of it? And number two, is it worth it based on what the market is doing? Okay, let's continue here. Um, Jay Kester is saying, any other tips on how to delay debt payment in order to keep dollars in HELOC longer? Um, another one, I, th I think you mentioned it earlier, is obviously using a credit card um, before the, the statement period is over. Uh, what's nice about credit cards is they give you 21 to 30 days of interest-free period where you're not having to pay any interest on the, on the purchases. So that gives you a little bit of time where you got 30 days, up to 30 days, uh, depending on which credit card company you go with, where they're not going to charge you any interest. So you can do all your expenditures and spending on your credit card. And at the very last day of the, the statement day, you can go ahead and use your HELOC to wipe it out, which should further uh, elongate the, the, uh, the lower balance on your HELOC. So uh, I hope that helps. I mean, the only other way I, I, I could potentially see is to stop spending money, but obviously that's impossible. Um, so that's probably the best bet, uh, at least what our students are getting uh, in terms of elongating uh, the, the lowered average daily balance on your HELOC. Okay. Uh, is TIA the best bank, uh, the best HELOC company? What terms of the HELOC would you suggest? So TIA is actually no longer around. They have been bought out by, I believe, Bank of America or U.S. Bank, either of those two banks, big banks. So TIA Bank has been uh, bought out by another bank, and this new bank that they bought out uh, doesn't offer the same HELOC. Um, so there is, uh, of course, one of the things that you get as, a, as, a, as one of our students in our program is you get a full complimentary list of all the banks that offer some of the better HELOCs that we've seen. So uh, if you're a student, you got access to that, you just go to the course dashboard and you'll see all the list of banks and uh, financial uh, institutions that offer uh, some really amazing HELOC products. Um, we don't get paid by them. Obviously, that'd be illegal for us to get any kickbacks, but uh, we suggest them because we want our students to be successful when it comes to using our strategy. Uh, so for those who are watching that are part of the program, you guys have access to that uh, available to you right away, okay? Uh, Clarice Keen is saying, do you think it is a good idea to use my credit card instead of opening a PLOC? What is the difference between a credit card and a PLOC anyway? So the difference between a personal line of credit versus a credit card is how, um, how easy it is to access the cash. So when it comes to credit cards, we have cash advance, right? Cash advances. And uh, you have only a certain amount of limit in your cash advances. You can only take so much. Plus the interest rate on the, the cash advances, I think is is really excessive. I know here in our shows and here in the Quack Brothers, we talk about how the interest rates really don't matter. But I think when it comes to cash advances, it's kind of off the charts. It's like 30% in some cases. That might be a little bit too much. So credit card, when it comes to access to cash, may not be the best thing. Uh, although if you can use credit cards um, to do this strategy by doing what's called an overdraft advance or overdraft um, protection. So that's one way you can do it, but not the best. Uh, personal line of credit is probably more liquid than a credit card. So uh, this is why we're a bigger fan of a uh, personal line of credit. And personal line of credit has a lower interest rate, which again, really doesn't matter. But if that's your thing, then yeah, personal line of credit has a lower interest rate. Uh, plus, it's easier to access cash. 
Um, and also you can link it up with your, your checking account for easy access anytime. So that it's more, it, it has more so to do with easy access, how liquid it is than the actual interest rate uh, and the, um, uh, the functionality of it. So I hope that answers your question there. Um, yeah. Okay. So Marta Garcia is asking, I do have $20,000 on a money bag. <laughs> Can I keep on cash or pay my line of credit? Um, in the context of our strategy, I would say put that $20,000 towards your line of credit. Your cash, guys, is deroding. There's something called inflation, right? This year, I believe the inflation is 2%. So the longer you keep your cash in your, um, your checking account, it's deroding, it's devaluing every day, it's not helping you. Um, one way to, to, to uh, use that cash is obviously to use our strategy to put that cash in your line of credit which now it's saving you anywhere between 5 to 10% in interest. So there's a Benjamin uh, Franklin quote that says, a penny saved is penny earned. So if you save 5 to 10% on your personal line of credit by taking that $20,000 and putting it into your line of credit, well, it's effectively, according to Benjamin Franklin, you saved that 5 to 10% on the $20,000 uh, in terms of average daily balance reduction. So I hope that answers the question there, uh, Marta. So um, I don't see any other questions from here and out. Uh, because the topic today is improving your credit, um, guys, keep that utilization rate, rate low, right? 30% or, or less. Um, pay your bills on time, okay? Don't use shortcuts or illegal tactics to improve your credit. Um, no, don't get a CPN. CPNs are illegal. Certain trade lines are also illegal. Uh, don't steal identity. I'm sure you guys won't do that. Uh, but don't assume other uh, people's identity looking to improve your credit. Um, it's not a good thing. Now, when it comes to business credit, that's a whole different conversation that we can have uh, because business credit is treated differently. Uh, business credit doesn't necessarily factor in utilization rate in terms of your uh, credit health. So if you have a business credit card that only reports your business credit report, uh, the good news is you can jack it up and max it out and it's, it won't have much effect on your business credit which is nice. But of course, you know, with any financial uh, decision, you probably shouldn't be maxing out anything, right? You want to keep it uh, relatively low or, or medium. Uh, so that's, that's my suggestion in my opinion. But when it comes to your business credit, uh, what's more important is how well do you pay on time, okay? If you pay on time or if you pay early, boom, you get a better business credit uh, score in health which business credit score uh, is, is used using, uh, if, you, if you're talking about Dun & Bradstreet, which is a business credit, um, business credit bureau, uh, they use a Paydex score, which I believe is a scale between zero to 100. So 80 and up is good when it comes to your Paydex score, when it comes to your business credit. Um, I know there's FICO, there's another uh, credit um, scoring model that, that just came out by FICO. I, I gotta go back and research uh, to give you guys the accurate uh, description of this, but. It's, I believe, zero to 300 is the, the scoring range for this FICO scoring model. I'll have to get back with you guys on that one. So uh, that's another one. Uh, here's another question. Dame Rhodes is saying, do I need an LLC to have business credit? Um, yes and no. Uh, you do actually want to have a separate entity. Yeah, so I guess the answer is yes. Um, you want to have a separate entity, whether it be an LLC or a corporation, because you, you need the EIN, Employer Identification Number, to establish business credit. Uh, so yes, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, I haven't seen anyone do it with a DBA or a sole proprietorship. Um, so it's gotta be an LLC or a corporation, okay? And, and, and if you want the 100% accurate answer, I'll get back with you on that one. I know you guys uh, have been introduced to Melvin, our in-house credit expert. So I'll, I'll have a chat with Melvin to see what he says because uh, he's the, the ultimate credit expert that we have here in the Quack Brothers, okay? All right, uh, let's see here. So uh, another thing I want to talk about, and I'll give you a little preview of what we're going to talk about next week, uh, but before we do, I want to mention our special event that's coming out this weekend, and it's never too late to get your ticket. So if you want to get into real estate investing, you know, you're stuck because you don't have good credit, which we talked about credit today, or you don't have the money to get into real estate investing or to buy a home, well, fear not, come to this weekend's uh, event in Dallas, Texas on October 4th and 5th. Uh, Daniel and myself will be there to train you guys on a brand new strategy called the Four Strategy. Some of, you have, some of you may have seen our video on it that was just released last week. 
So the fourth strategy is all about helping you and, and teaching you guys and training you on how to acquire real estate properties, whether it's rentals or fix and flips, without ever having to use your own credit or without having to use your own money. In fact, that's how Daniel and I got started. We didn't have any money, we didn't have uh, good credit, so we had to use other methods, creative ways, to get into real estate investing. So if you guys wanna meet us in person, shake our hands, ask us questions, take pictures with us, if you want to break bread with us, coffee with us, come to this uh, event on Friday and Saturday. Tickets are starting at $149 right now, never too late. Um, it, I know it's Wednesday, uh, we got two more days to go, but it's never too late. We still have seats open and available for you guys to join us. So go to marketdominationmastermind.com. Again, that's marketdominationmastermind.com. Grab your tickets today, get your hotel rooms and your flight. Can't wait to see you guys there, okay? All right, so a little bit of preview uh, for next week. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and actually start introducing uh, more and more how to pivot our HELOC into real estate investing. Like, how do we start using our HELOC strategy to create more passive income? I know we have a video out there that's got close to 50,000 views uh, that talks about that. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and do a special Q&A session just on that. So uh, instead of going defensive on how to save money, now we're gonna go and talk about the offensive. How do we actually make money with the HELOC that we have? And also, uh, in the same tone, how do we use the HELOC in a way that it's protecting us from a recession? And I do believe that, that we're due for a recession very soon here. Uh, could happen any moment, could happen next week, uh, could happen next year, who knows. Um, but we're, I believe we're due for a recession. So uh, we're gonna talk about how do we protect ourselves from a potential recession? What if the bank you know, closes down our HELOC? What if they shut it down or freeze it? We'll talk about how to prevent uh, some of that, uh, the risk to in running into those situations. So we'll talk about that next week. Okay, we got Michael Wong is asking, once we get a HELOC, do we pay off credit cards with it? Uh, I don't know, Michael, it depends. Uh, what does your cash flow index have to say? So our students in our program, we go through what's called the cash flow index uh, analysis, where we actually give a score on each of your uh, different credit cards and auto loans and mortgages that you may have. So depending on what your score is, we pay down uh, whichever credit card or auto loan or mortgage that's affecting your cash flow the most. So if you have credit card A and credit card B and credit card C, and let's say credit card A is taking the most amount of your, amount of your cash flow away from you relative to your credit card balance, well, we're gonna go and pay off the credit card A first so that we can recover as much cash flow first so that we can go and start snowballing into the next debt to pay our next debt even faster uh, had we not been paying attention to the order of which debt to pay off, okay? Uh, Jason Jammin is, is, saying, is saying, can you get a 30-year loan on a $20,000 to $30,000 home? Yeah, so I can see the difficulty there because uh, most banks don't want to lend on a very small amount uh, when it comes to a mortgage. Uh, in fact, I meet more banks that don't even offer mortgages below $50,000. So what you may have to get more so it might be have to be a, uh, I think I'm reading that right. Yeah, it may have to be a, a personal line of credit or a business line of credit or secured line of credit. There are uh, secured line of credit uh, or asset uh, backed line of credit uh, for for something that's small as twenty to thirty thousand dollars. In fact, I have a business line of credit that's twenty five thousand dollars. I know I meet some people that have $50,000 line of business line of credit. So it might be better just to get a business line of credit than trying to get a mortgage or a 30 year loan or any amortization loan from the get go. In fact, uh, I don't think getting a 30 year mortgage is even good of a financial decision from the get go. I think um, a better decision should be, and this is just my opinion, is to get a, a purchase HELOC, right? A HELOC that allows you to purchase a home and you don't have to get a mortgage and then a, then a second uh, position HELOC, you can get a first position HELOC that is pretty much a purchase, a HELOC, right? So you get a HELOC from the get-go instead of having to get a mortgage first and then a HELOC, you can just get a mortgage to purchase a home from the start. So that's something that you guys can do uh, instead of having to get a mortgage first and then get a HELOC, okay? All right, it is 11.46 Central Time. I'm gonna wrap it up right here. I know we had some tech issues going on. Uh, the whiteboard wasn't working, a bunch of stuff happening. Uh, distractions, okay, North Korean invasions digitally. So uh, we're going to end it here. We're going to continue our conversation next week. How do we pivot from defensive use of our HELOC to offensive use of our HELOC? We'll come back next week. 
For those who are joining us this weekend at Dallas, Texas, I'll see you guys there. I'll have my best suit on. You know, you'll, you'll smell my awesome cologne and just, you know, you'll be amazed. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but seriously, come join us. I'd love to meet with you guys and have conversations in person. Uh, I love meeting people. So I'll see you guys in Dallas, Texas. And for those who are not making it, you guys are going to miss out on, on a lot of great training. Uh, but either way, we'll see you guys next Wednesday right here at 11 o'clock Central Time to answer more of your life's important questions. All right, I'll see you guys next week.